Today, Catherine Joy and myself are going to be discussing a topic that has been discussed for thousands of years. And today, we are going to enlighten anyone that listens to this on what the truth is. Okay, I feel like you could hear the intimidation in Elisha's voice. This is a big topic, but I also think it's a very simple topic, and it's something that has really been on my heart a lot recently, because we have a, um, a lot of people from a lot of different faiths that listen to our podcast, which is incredible. We're so grateful for that. Um, but also, we're obviously Christians, and that even in and of itself, the term Christian can have a lot of different, uh, like, God. Definitions? Definitions, yeah, yeah. That can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. <laughs> Thanks, Alicia. And so today, we just want to talk about being a Christian. Mm. And I just, I would hate for you guys to listen to this podcast for years and years and years. And I mean, we believe in a true heaven and a true hell. So we get to that afterlife, that uh, eternal life that we're promised in Scripture. And you guys look at us and are like, wow, you told us all this stuff about marriage and family. You told us all this practical stuff. But why didn't you tell us about the most important thing, which is mm. the gospel? Mm. And that's just become a really big fear of mine. And we're going to dive into a lot of different things in this podcast. I guess I'm just... I just pulled out my soapbox and I'm going to get started. Yeah, I thought that was going to be the intro. Is that the intro? <laughs> I think or? this is the intro. Okay, and then I think I will add on to that since, since we're just doing a long intro here. Okay. I think we're going to be discussing the gospel and Christianity as it pertains to its differentiation from simply uh, from just Christian values. Yeah, so um, the difference between moralism and Christianity. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Anyways, that's... That's the intro. The Now That We're a Family Podcast. All right. Well, KB, man, I feel bad cutting you off there during the intro. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad jumping in. <laughs> Usually only one of us does the intro. We both agreed Elisha was going to do the intro, and then I just got to be in my bonnet. You did. I like what you said, though. And okay. There was a big, I am really excited about today's episode because if there is one thing that Katie and I are both so wholeheartedly united in, um, it is this, it is the, um, the, the, I guess the, um, the supremacy of Christ and, um, the power, the power of the gospel and the hope of the gospel and our unwavering confidence being in that, in that alone, in, in the finished work of Christ. That is 100% where Katie and I put our hope and our trust. Like if we were going to, if we were going to go all in on, on anything we have, we're going all in on Jesus Christ, on his life, death, burial, resurrection, his righteousness, his work. Um, that's like a hundred percent of where our hope is in this life and in, in the life to come, as Katie alluded to, um, that, I mean, we are dying. We are go these bodies are going to die, and we, there is an afterlife, and it's heaven or it's hell. And your right standing before God, or your lack thereof, is going to determine where you spend eternity. And I think the Bible makes it explicitly clear that in and of ourselves, we are incapable of meeting God's perfect standard. But Christ did meet that standard. On our behalf, he came and he, he's the only person that's lived a Christian life. He lived the perfect sinless life that no man ever has lived or woman has ever lived. And he died bearing our sins on the cross. He didn't sin, but he identified as a sinner on our behalf and he bore our sins, took him to the grave and he conquered sin and death um, so we can have that hope. So it's really fun to be able to do an episode really emphasizing this thing because of course, you have heard Katie and I are like-minded on many things in life, but this is the one thing that we are like the most united on. When did you say Katie? Baby? Yeah, for sure. I think why this is so important is because as parents, 
we can find ourselves slipping into teaching moralism to our children instead of teaching the gospel to our children, regardless of what our belief system is. I think that it's really easy, even when you are of the Christian faith, to teach moralism. And moralism doesn't save anybody. There's a lot of good people walking around, and it, it can be harder, a lot harder, for a, you know, air quotes, good person who does everything right, who lives by biblical values even, to realize their need for a savior because they've already got it figured out. They're already good. They're already better than the next guy down the street. They're already seeing fruit. They're already seeing results from their labor because um, it says in Proverbs, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And we see in Proverbs a lot of examples of if you live by this law, this will happen. There's a lot of cause and effect with wise you know, following wisdom, which is ultimately from Christ, and then following the wisdom of the world, yeah, which is or foolishness. Or or sin, yeah. Yeah, so I think it would be very easy, and this is where I think I had this fear come up. I think it would be very easy to listen to the podcast and take what, you know, Elisha and I are saying, maybe some practical stuff, or maybe a guest that we have on the show, and you take that and you apply it to your family, and somehow and you start to see results in your family and you feel like that somehow is saving you or saving your marriage or, you know, saving your children or making you right with God. Yeah. Or making you right with God. And it's not, it's just not, um, nothing that you can do, nothing that I could do could make us right before God, aside from accepting him taking his wrath upon himself mm. ultimately, because Jesus God and the Holy Spirit are all the same person. And so when Jesus died on the cross, and this was something that was very, it stood out to me because I never fully realized this until, I don't know, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, was that God didn't just sacrifice his son. God and Jesus are one. Mm. Jesus is fully God yeah. and fully man. The Father and the Son are one. Yeah. Yes, the Father and the Son are, are one. And God ultimately took his wrath that we deserved as sinful human beings who have fallen so far short of his glory and took it upon himself mm -hmm. in the form of Jesus. And that's just the ultimate sacrifice. I think as a parent, you think sacrificing your child, but God wasn't just sacrificing a child. He was sacrificing his own self yeah. for us. Yeah, and just because I love everything you just said, Katie, babe, but... There's some probably glaring No, are you kidding me? No, I'm just going to catch up for me. <laughs> there's theological mishaps is going to be on my end. Just using the term walking around as good people, I think you, you mm -hmm. said, that's only by man's standards. I think it's yeah. easy to say, hey, I'm a pretty good person. Or I'm a, you know, we, we use that term lightly and flippantly, like, oh, he's a good guy. Or she's a, you know, she's a great lady. She's a good lady. Um, and that's actually not according to God's standards, the case, you know, the Bible says there, there are none that doeth good. No, not one. There are none righteous. All have fallen short and are, are deserving of God's punishment. And so when we say things like I'm a pretty good person or, you know, they're a good person that can really be misleading and deceiving to that person. And they think, okay, well explain to me then if, if you're calling me a good person, why would I, why would I pursue needing a savior? Like, why would I ever need a savior? Um, and, and so I think that even using that term, good person, we should probably stay away from because I think it's easy to feel like you're a good person when you're looking left and right and comparing yourself to other people. But ultimately God's the standard and he's set the standard for us and we we just fail to meet that. And what's ironic is that, yeah, we fall extremely short of God's standards. And I'm going to bring this up just because you and I were talking about it the other day. I, I think it says somewhere in Romans that we fail to even meet our own standards and then C.S. Lewis talks a lot about this. It's like we come up with our own measuring stick and the Bible tells us, okay, well, let's use your measuring stick then. If you think this is a standard, giving to the poor, being charitable, being patient, having, you know, being kind towards one another. It's really popular right now. Just be like, yeah, we got to be kind. We got to, it's like, okay, let's use that. We'll use your standard. Did you meet your standard perfectly? Well, no, actually nobody's ever met even their own standard perfectly, let alone God's standard. And so I think when you look at it from that perspective, you can accept I'm actually not, I'm not a good person, like according to God's standard. Yeah. And that's the only standard that matters. Mm. And we're all that way. Um, it doesn't matter how you grew up, what family you grew up in, you know, the Lord really protected 
Elisha and I both kind of have these freakishly protected lives that we've lived in the way that like the Lord just has guarded us from a lot of the darkness, a lot of the evil in the world. We didn't experience firsthand. We didn't have a lot of traumatic experiences, you know, um, compared to, Compared to, I don't know, a lot of people that I've talked to. Yeah, probably the majority of the world. Yeah, and it's just, it's humbling. I don't know why he chose to do that, but he did. It's a gift, and I don't want to feel guilty for him giving me that gift. But, like, I think, I I don't think I realized until I was about 7 or 18, just the vileness of my own heart. 17 or 18? 17 or 18 years old, yeah, and my desperate need for a Savior, because until that point... I still feel like I was looking outward and measuring myself by other people's standards. And I was like, I'm doing pretty good. Like, I'm a good girl. I don't do dumb stuff or whatever, you know. But just even that pride, you know, the Bible talks about how God resists the proud. There are so many verses about him resisting the proud. And at the very least, that pride was just not sending a sweet savor up to the Lord. Yeah. You know, he, said he was that, strongly opposing it. Yeah, strongly opposing it. And it's it's terrifying to be opposed by God who created man. You know, we're specks. Like when you see a one of those documentaries and you just see how far out space goes mm-hmm. for years and light years and light years and light years. And you just see like you can't even see Earth. And then you can't imagine how big we are on Earth. But like the Lord chose to create us and he delights in us. And he chose to lay down his life for us. And it's just incredibly humbling. And who are we to say, hey, I'm good. And who cares what you think? You know what I mean? Like, we have zero control over over what happens to us. You know, oh, yeah. all our breath is from the Lord. Every single breath. Yes, he's the creator. He holds all things together. He's the alpha and the omega. And so he gets to say what the standard is. He gets yeah. to say what righteousness is. Um, and it's Katie even referring to high school. It is crazy too. Likewise for myself, um, thinking that I think I was a pretty good guy first off, cause I got told that because I didn't do the, I mean, and this is still common vernacular. I think in Christianity, it's like, Oh, they're a good kid. They don't, they don't smoke or drink or sleep around. It's like, there was like a, maybe a list of like the big four or five things. And it's like, Oh yeah, they're a good Christian kid. They don't do those things as if those are the defining factors. Those, yeah. those few, those few things that make you right with God or not right with God, not even addressing the sins of the heart, you know, not addressing the, the sins of omission and commission. Um, and so I think that like, go again, I don't want to get too derailed. So we want to stop, talk specifically to how this can be brought into our home. Oftentimes I'm teaching morality more than the gospel, um, and teaching morality in light of the gospel because the gospel and Christian Christianity produces fruit. It does that, you know, the Bible talks about, Oh, you know, show me your, um, show me your, show me your works. Okay. How's it go? Show me, I'll show you my faith. Oh, by, yeah. I'll show you my faith by my works. Like it, it does produce good works, but it produces the good works. It does good works does not create salvation. It doesn't. Yes. Ever. And I think that's ultimately like, like good works does not create salvation and there's only one way to heaven and that is through Jesus Christ and believing him to be Lord Mm -hmm. and our savior. And that's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. So if we believe anything less than that, and if we are anything less than slaves to Christ, completely not owned by ourselves, but by him, then, then, then I don't want to give you a false hope. If you're listening that you're going to spend one day eternally um, united with him. Mm. Because there's a lot of different faiths that believe a lot of things kind of similar. Mm. Um, But being a good person isn't enough. Believing that Jesus was a good teacher isn't enough. Um, You need to go, I would really encourage you to read the Gospels if you believe he was just a good teacher. Because really, you have to throw out Jesus completely if you read the Gospels. And can't say that Jesus is God. It's either he's God or he's not God. Yeah. And I think, um, again, a, a few other faiths similar to ours as well will say that Jesus is good. He's our older brother. He led the way for us. But he's not God. He's not equal with God. Mm-hmm. And Jesus made it very clear that he is equal with God. Yeah, it is crazy. Yeah. 
it, uh, I'm blown away when I, because uh, deconstructionism has become such a, a common thing amongst, amongst our demographic um, and amongst our age group. I'm blown away when I go back to the Gospels on how explicit they are. I'll be like, well, maybe it is kind of vague, because that is one of the first things that people will start to throw out, of oh, the deity of Jesus Christ or the virgin birth or uh, the substitute, the penal substitutionary death. You know, did he actually really die? Was he, was he truly dying for our sins? Was that, is that how bad we are? Well, we're not really that bad that someone would actually have to suffer that way. And, but then you go, and from the get in Matthew, it's just a supernatural, or supernatural divine pregnancy. Like a virgin it conce- conceives by the Holy Spirit. That's the first stuff that's talked about after the quick, you know, after the genealogy, which it obviously is important. But like the narrative starts in Matthew with Mary being like having this miraculous conception. And so from the get, it's like, no, this is God. This is God and man. He's fully God and he's fully man, right from the beginning of the of the New Testament. And then it just gets more and more robust, you know, as far as the divinity of Jesus Christ from that point forward. And something that I'm going to do is with this post, we don't do this with all of our podcasts, but if you look in the show notes, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're on the audio version of the podcast, um, I, I'm going to write a blog post with all the links because I felt very unprepared today with actual references. And I want to give you guys specific places to be able to go up and look up scripture. I know Elisha has some, but I feel like we've already referenced a ton of verses in part that are in the scripture. And if you want to go and you want to look over them or see them in context or any of those things, I think that would be really helpful. Um, yeah. And I apologize actually, yeah, for even already referencing script, using scripture, but not giving the reference to it. Cause a lot of times that can be confusing. And I want you to know that if I'm first off, I don't want to speak with authority that the Bible's not spoken with authority to. And so if I'm airing on that, then obviously I don't want to lead anybody else astray. But if I am speaking with authority and it is from the word of God, I want that to be the authority. Be like, Oh, that this is the reference. The word of God says it clearly, you know, check it out right here. So if you got an issue with it, take it up with the Bible. Yeah. We do have a podcast specifically on like, what must I do to be saved? And we did list out a lot of references in that uh, podcast. So I'll also try to link that down below in the show notes. Um, if that's one that we've recovered. Mm. So I think we were able to recover that. Yeah. Show. But yeah, we were a lot more prepared with references on that. And I do that think that when it comes to these things, when it's literally a life or death situation, because this life here is only a precursor. It's it's not even a life really. Like when you think of it, it's just like it's a blip, it's a vapor, it's so short compared to eternity with Christ. If we we're gonna see it on a map, you know. Like, what is 80 years compared to eternity? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's we can't even fathom it in our human minds. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and also time. Like, God created time. He's outside of time. I don't even know where I'm going yeah. with that. Well, that just that really blows yeah. my mind. I'm excited well, to hear I, you I, break I can't that explain down. that because <laughs> <laughs> I, I am a finite creature that lives within these limits that have been created. But that's the ironic thing is they have been created with me. So even when we try to use our own logic to prove whether God's there, whether he's not, or all these things, we're still using only the finite like rules of time and space and gravity that he created. And he's outside all of those things. Yeah. Uh, Anyways, I just think it's kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's, we'll list a bunch of references because like for instance, you know, you say, well, what is? How do you be, how do you become a Christian? What is a Christian? And that term is used so, uh, I guess, flippantly or commonly. You know, like you look at how many people identify as Christian or they don't identify as Christian, and you're like, well, what does that even mean? And we've, I think, we've lost a lot of the um, the power actually in that because for growing up, you probably went through a stage like this. It's like, well, I'm I'm serious about my faith. I don't want to just call myself a Christian. Because, like, I want people to know that I'm not, like, the I'm, I'm the next step. And so I'd be like, I'm a follower of Jesus. You know, or I'm a follower of Christ. I I'm think like, it was just you. <laughs> I think me and a, a lot of people that I was around, it's yeah, like yeah. We, wanted, we wanted to distinguish ourselves from the masses, right? I'm, I'm not saying this is, well, I'm yeah, not trying to justify this. From cultural Christianity. Yeah. I think because, like, you know, America has been said to be, again, air quotes, like, a Christian nation. And, like, what does that even mean? Mm-hmm. You know, like, 
our founding fathers wrote about God and the Constitution and stuff, but it really comes down to each individual. And I think that because Christianity is so widely accepted, it's still the you know number one religion in the world, there's just a ton of misconceptions and gray areas and... It's easy to just say, hey, sure, throw me in that category. Yes, you know? that's so I think true. there's God out there. Sure, I'm a Christian. You know? Yeah, I'll take, I'll take that one. Um, but, but even that word Christian, obviously, you know, Christ is at the center of that word. And it's like, okay, you're Christ-like or you're a follower of Christ. Or people would even meet, use it to be like, you're, you're a little Christ. That's, it was used like in a derogatory term in the early church when, oh, when people were associating themselves with Christ. They were trusting in Jesus Christ and they believed that he did die and then he rose again. And people are mocking me. They're like, oh, they're a bunch of like little Christ Christians. And you, even the word Christ, I think has lost so much meaning to us because it's thrown around so flippantly, but that word in and of itself has so many implications because that wasn't Jesus's name. You know, Jesus is, it wasn't like, you know, Jesus was his first name. Christ was his last name. His name was Jesus, but he was the Christ that, you know, Israel, the children of Israel that, that had been looking forward to, that the Old Testaments had prophesied about. And that word Christ, what meant Messiah, meant Redeemer to them. And so when we say the word Christ, like if we actually probably had a deeper, if I had a deeper understanding as to what that word actually meant, then saying I'm a Christian would probably even mean more to me. Because mm-hmm. it's like by associating with Christ or believing that he is the Christ, that Jesus was the Christ, I'm saying he's my redeemer, he's the Messiah, he's delivered me, he's purchased me. That's all kind of packed into that word, or it's that title, I should say, because what it is, it's a title. It's Christ. Um, and and so we've kind of gone so far away from even knowing what the word or that title means. Yeah. It's easy to just throw out, I'm a Christian, and be like, well, what does that mean? And people say, well, I'm a follower of Jesus. And even that can be confusing because it's like okay so is that how you get saved do you follow jesus you're like well if you do it perfectly like and you go back to matthew and jesus told you how to be saved and you had your righteousness had to exceed that of the pharisees and he actually goes on to say be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect and so and you also had to carry your cross right up there with them and nobody's done that and so do we want to follow in jesus's ways absolutely as christians is that a good thing to be a follower of jesus absolutely but you're not saved by being a follower of Jesus because nobody's done it perfectly at all. He lived the Christian life on our behalf and he did purchase us. He redeemed us. He is our righteousness. Are we followers of Jesus? Absolutely. I want to follow in his ways, but that's not what saves me. Yeah. I think back to the term, you know, everyone was wearing these bracelets and I still think they're probably pretty popular in some Christian circles, but like the WWJD or like, mm-hmm. what would Jesus do? Right. And it's supposed to help these teenage kids like in the moment think like, okay, well, what would Jesus do in this situation? But I heard it presented in such a different way. And that is what has Jesus done? This is nap time, you guys. And during lunch, I uh, (laughs) am like I should mention this. We probably should have mentioned it at the beginning. I know, but you just started going. I started going and then you started going and I just... I don't know. We can just move on. I'll explain it. <laughs> it looks so weird. If you're on the video, well, you actually can probably hear this if you're just listening to it. Yeah, Katie burned her hand pretty bad during lunch. I um, had a cast iron pan in the oven at 500 degrees, took it out, and then just grab it with my bare hand. Grab it with my bare hand and just fry my hand. And Leon, Leon's sitting there at the table, he goes, yeah, mama does that all the time. <laughs> Anyway, so Anyways, we like went to get the gauze and to wrap it up. We, they, there wasn't any gauze left. There wasn't any wrap. And so we found like a bandage and then wrapped it with saran wrap. And so it looks really official. It looks, uh, it looks weird actually. <laughs> if you're watching this on the camera. Anyways, okay. So moving on though, moving back, I should say, into what has Jesus done? I think what did Jesus do places so much of the emphasis on, okay, well, how can I muster up the courage or the humility or the kindness or the, you know, the character trait, the moral virtue here to respond well in this situation? Because Jesus was, was perfect and he had to have a perfect response to this situation. 
Instead of when we're motivated by, or I'm a lot more motivated, I should say, by, okay, what has Jesus done? And when I realized, wow, he went to the cross for me, he overlooked everything that I've ever done and my my negligence of pursuing him, my forgetfulness of him. He knows every thought I've had. He's known every word I've said. And he still chose to do that for me. It's like, it's so humbling in that moment. I often find like, if I think of that in a tough moment, maybe I'm having a tough time relationally with someone else, or I feel like I've been wrong or something like that. Or even with, when it's with my kids, it's like, wow, I can respond in grace to you. Mm-hmm. You know, I have been forgiven the ultimate penalty, which is death and separation from God. I can extend a little grace here. Yeah. Um, anyways, it just puts a different emphasis on. It does, yeah. And, and you said he overlooked, and I, I don't even think he overlooked. I think he looked directly yeah, he did. at our sin, saw how depraved we were, how helpless we were, and he died in in spite of those things because of how helpless that we were. And that's why. that's what exactly what he was looking at ultimately, when he did die, you know, was our helplessness, the sins we had committed, our, our, our failures. Um, anyways. <laughs> I guess something that we don't want to do is to mm, confuse our children when it comes to moralism and make and give them a false hope. And give them the false hope that, hey, if you obey daddy and mama and you're a good boy or a good girl and you do all these things, then you go to heaven. Because that's just not true. Um, And I think it's really easy when teaching all kinds of lessons to just teach it from a behavioral standpoint Mm -hmm. instead of from a standpoint of um, just the Lord's righteousness and our sinfulness before him but the fact that he chose to still redeem us Mm. as his own and like what a gift that is and it's so sweet to hear Leon pray because he's five but it just makes me smile because and I'm so humble because I feel like he really understands the gospel in like a simple way that like a child does you Mm. know he doesn't know how to complicate it but I I mean we might have shared this before but (laughs) one time we like, it was a rough morning, and he goes down, sits down to pray at lunch, and he was like, dear Lord, we have all sinned. Mommy has sinned, Daddy has sinned, I have sinned, and we need you. <laughs> we thank you that you died on the cross, so that even when we sin, we can still go to heaven with you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, man. And he was just like fervent, like he's not trying to guilt trip me but I was so convicted it's like it's so true Mm. but but, um thank the Lord that we don't just need to like be better Uh, he has he has saved us Mm. yeah and I think that maybe warnings in my own life or that it just kind of this warning that we feel like we want to have on our hearts and and probably pass it on to others um when you are raising your children, I think it is your, your God-given duty to teach them morals and to teach them right and wrong and to teach them, you know, the law, so to speak, the Ten Commandments, um, and to, and to, so they can distinguish between right and wrong. It's not that we're keeping everything vague and we say, oh, we're only, we're only teaching grace, meaning like, yeah, yes, nothing's really, yeah, we were wrong, that was mean, that was like, but it's okay, nothing's really permanent, nothing's really Well, it's bad like you can good. do what you want and Jesus still loves you. That's not like the motto we're teaching our kids. Mm-hmm. Like, is it true? Well, to a point, to be honest, because the Bible also says that if we're in outright rebellion to God, he will turn us over to our own desires and remove us from his presence. Mm-hmm. So, it's not like, this grace that's just like just go do whatever the heck you want and I got you covered over here you know and I think that sometimes we can take it to that point um, of ultimately rebelling and abandoning God in pursuit of our own desires I feel like if we are truly blood bought children of Christ then he's not going to allow that to happen yeah I mean I'm so I guess grateful Every time, um, I just feel my conscience. Yes. 
because uh, I just, I'm so grateful. Yeah. It's just so gracious of God to do that, to convict me of, and this is happening recently. I mean, this is just such a real time thing. It just happens all the time. Um, I shouldn't say all the time because it's, I feel like I'll go through droughts and, and I won't be sensitive. My conscience won't be sensitive and I won't be sensitive to, you know, my shortcomings and to my failures. And then the Lord's so merciful to just, yeah, to really make me see the sin in my life mm-hmm. and to bring me back to what he's done and repentance. And so I do think that is a trait of somebody that just believes. They believe in that what we've already talked about, the finished work of Christ. They now, they have a conscience mm-hmm. that's now, like you said, the Holy Spirit dwells within them. And they are not going to be able to just, yeah, like we but are now slaves to Christ. We were slaves to sin continue before. continue in sin without the guilt and the shame and the, like, knowing you're separated from God and wanting that repentance. Yeah. I don't yeah. think we can just have a callous heart to it and continue in sin. Oh, yeah. And, and I don't, I think that that's an interesting thing because as humans, we can't help but be, because we actually, even, we do have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us when you are saved um, and when you believe in, in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Um, but even, Prior, if you're not saved, you still have a moral code. Like, it's just built into humans of right and wrong. And you're like, well, no, well, that doesn't exist. And if, if, yeah, it does. Like, when somebody takes something from you or somebody rips you off, like, you feel the moral code. You, you feel know? wronged. You feel wronged. Um, and, you, and you do, even if you aren't a Christian, you'll feel guilty sometimes. And even if you're not a Christian, you will feel good about yourself when you are generous or when you're kind to other people. And so we are, we have a, a moral gauge within us as humans and which can get callous yes just exactly not like that okay this old indian proverb i heard one time oh, and, <laughs> yeah so we're deviating a little bit here um but it stuck with me and that was they said that inside your heart was a little triangle and <laughs> like, so listen i thought listen, we wanted to talk it's about it's a great word picture <laughs> okay okay and every time you did something wrong, it would spin and prick you, oh. and you'd like feel the pain of it. But over time, if you just kept repeating the same things, you would wear all the pricks off the triangle, and it would become a circle. And it would just spin around and around and around and around, and yes. you'd never feel anything. Wow. And it just really stuck with me, because we maybe, like, I've been callous to certain things in my life, mm. for sure, where I've just grown um, dead or cold to things that I should feel um, wrong, that are wrong. You know, maybe watching things or listening to things or having or gossiping or things like that and getting caught up in like, oh, I just feel it's totally normal instead of like, wow, like the pricks have worn off my little pricker, you know? And I just think we need need to be sensitive, this sensitive to those um, pricks. Yes. And and obviously that is not biblical or anything. I just thought it was a great word picture. Anyways, I'm going to go through a, That was a great word picture. No, no, sorry. I wasn't trying to blow you off. That, that, I think that is good. Boom. But I don't want to be... I, I stand by what you just said, but I also don't think Indian Proverbs are the ultimate authority. Anything. Well, I think that's more... I think it aligns more with the whole moralism thing. Yes, yes. Because absolutely. you can do that regardless of what your faith is. Yeah, and I think things that I find myself being almost like swayed by in turn... That, that take me away from my identity in Christ and that take me away from that fundamental belief that Jesus Christ is my only hope is when you find yourselves ide- like relating with people in different areas of life. And it's really fun. We love relating and finding camps and we, we want to be a part of a tribe and we want to be accepted into different communities. And so when there's when you share a value that you feel is a godly value or a godly conviction and then you find somebody else that shares that value, you're like, we are so united on this thing, but people that are not Christians can have God, can have Christian values. Yeah. They can have, they can share some things with you where you're like, this is great, you know, especially, especially here in America, just like good old America. We're like, yeah, work, at, work hard. You know, like, like, what is it like, you know, dirty hands and a pure heart or something like that. Just like work hard with your hands or clean money. Make country music. You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I feel like you're like quoting like old country songs. Yeah. Um, and 
It's like that. I do. I do believe in good work ethic. Or I like, believe, be faithful to your wife. Yes, like love your kids. Don't leave them. Absolutely. Like, Prioritize your family. Um, you know, serve your community. Guys. Yes. Be generous. Um, and then even if you start identifying with different like political causes, then that definitely starts happening where people are like, yes, they're my person because they are standing for this issue. And in reality, people can be standing for that issue and not be a Christian. Yes. And it, and it might be a good issue. It might be a something that is God honoring, God honoring something that Christians yeah. should stand by, but then non-Christians can be standing in accordance with it too. And if anything, it's like tempting to associate and to align our pe- selves with those people even more than the people of God. Mm-hmm. And as identify ourselves first and foremost as Christians and having that be our hope and our confidence is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, like all of these things that are fruits of my life or their convictions of my life are good things. But ultimately Christ is my hope and I'm identified by what he, I identify by what he says about me and who he says I am and what he's done for me. And I share in that with the other people that he says that about, with the other believers or the other blood bought children, the church, the, the people that are putting their hope in Jesus Christ and that he has, you know, the elect or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just throw that one out. I feel like we're going to get a million DMs. Like, what do you guys mean by elect? Um, but I think that something too, when it comes to teaching our kids, I think a lot of children's character studies that I found really teach our kids. Well, I have a hard time with it. I think Elisha and I both grew up being taught from uh, a certain church would you say what I don't know a certain what would you call it a ministry they put out a lot of these like character studies and uh moral teachings um but they weren't even though they were backed by like this is a Christian trait we weren't taught like okay this is we do this because God tells us to do this out of love for him and out of wanting to serve God. It was like, this is a good thing for you to do. And you're a good person if you do this. And it almost felt as a kid, like if you do this, then God will like you better and you'll be a better Christian. Oh yeah. I mean, that is again, and that's not, that's really harmful belief for a kid. Yes. Because they can just grow up to be very people pleasing and very, um, just put in a lot of faith in their goodness and in their works and feel like they deserve to go to heaven mm. because they did good things with their life and they were attentive and they took initiative and they were kind and they, you know. And that can lead to them never addressing the sin in their heart. Yeah, it can just, it can serve as this like block to realizing how in need of a savior we are. And so I think our dads really countered that a little bit later in life and just in their own teaching. And so that's, but I'm really hesitant to use any of those teaching materials uh, because I feel like it's just so easy for it to fall in that camp. And I'd rather just teach. I know you don't have to just teach straight from the Bible, but for me, it's just the cle- clearest cut. And that's why we teach most of our like good morals and character and values from Proverbs so far. And then reading books and, and just hearing how different people had good character and stuff like mm. that. Because... Uh, I just want to show the kids, yeah, the law, the Ten Commandments. Why do we obey these things? Because God said. It's clearly God's word. This is what he tells us to do. He bought us with the price. He owns us, and that's why we do it. Um, We don't do it for any other reason. Yeah, and do we do it to perfection? No. No. So, like, you can't, there is no boasting at the end of our life or at the end of the day. I did a good job because it's like, no, there is no boasting. Any, if you... It's always done imperfectly. Like... Do you guys feel that, like, in your own heart? I get so frustrated sometimes with how I'm doing something, and I know it's a good thing to do, and I'm so annoyed that I still have this ulterior motive. Yeah. And and I, like, I wish it wasn't there, and I just have to be like, Lord, like, you're the only one that can be perfect because I I wish I could do this completely pure, completely pure motive. Like, even just loving my kids, loving my husband. There's just always, like, something else there you know like I know it's better for me if I do those things too yeah oh I know like when I when I am treating you well during the day I know it's okay, coming for you later <laughs> oh my I know I'm <laughs> uh, you treat me good every day <laughs> um, 
what was I going to say? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you blacked out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that it is just human nature to think. Well, yeah. Speaking of quid pro quo, that, that's how we think. We think as humans, cause and effect. We think this, yeah. then that, and the laws of nature, the laws of gravity. What goes up must come down. If I, you know, you know, and, and a lot of these are proverbial tr truths. Um, you know, the boomerang is going to come back and a comeback. Like what goes around comes around, and and a lot of these things are kind of like general truths. But the gospel is contrary to all those things. Like mm -hmm. God came in, he's like, okay, you guys are expecting or used to, you know, earning your, your way for this and that. Here's the deal. Like there's nothing you can do to receive this, to, 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 to earn this. Like I'm going to do all of it. Like I'm, I, I wrote the story. I authored it. I penned it. I placed you in the story as characters. I put myself in as the heroes because you guys are not capable of it. And I'm going to keep you secure until the end of the story. Like, no, we we inevitably start thinking, well, what's our what's our role? Like, what's our part? What what do we do? And that's just the, the great blessing. But the contrariness of the gospel is like, that's you know, you, like you can't actually. Like, well, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, I like how you brought that up because that's why. Um, like a biblical Christian faith is different from every other religion out there. And that is because there's nothing you can do. There's literally nothing you can do to earn your righteousness. Now, should other people tell by our works that we're saved and that we're bought by Christ? Yes, because we're just motivated to praise our Savior and to serve Him. And like, what a gift we have been given. We want to give out of that, out of that blessing. But he doesn't require anything from us because he's already done it. And if you look at um, any other religion, you will see you have to do certain things. You're required to show up certain places or honor certain days or um, do certain rituals. And those things maybe put you in higher heavens mm -hmm. or get you in better standing with the gods or or God, depending on you know whether it's poly or monotheistic. Yes. Well, yeah, that's why Christian Christians are the only people that can actually say with one hundred percent confidence that we are saved and do it from a place of humility. There is zero pride in the Christian faith. Literally, there is no room for pride because if I am one hundred percent confident I am saved because of Christ's perfect work and what He did, that doesn't it, mean that there aren't proud Christians. We all struggle with pride. I mean, exactly. I there's, there's no, <laughs> again, there's nothing to boast in at the end of the day. Yeah. It's like, you, if somebody, the, a, what a proud response. If you said, are you, do you know if you're saved? And somebody says, I hope so. That's a pr prideful response because it implies that they've got something to do with their salvation. Mm -hmm. And you say, are you, are you saved? You say, absolutely. A hundred percent Say, How can you be so confident? Cause it's got nothing to do with me. And yeah, it's got a hundred percent to do with God and Jesus Christ and his, and his righteousness. Um, it's just another thing that I think can lead to a lot of moralism is we already said this only looking at this life, self-development, Katie and I love self-development. Are you kidding me? Like we love pursuing better health, better marriage. We love business and life hacks and better systems for our home. Um, we love, we love, like we love pursuing different quality of life things. But if you view Christianity through the lens of bettering your life, then you're just going to be, you're going to be inserting actually your life into all scripture. You're going to be like, okay, well, is this helping my life right now? Versus I've got an eternal soul right now that is, that in and of itself is not in a good standing with the holy and just God. And which begs the question, well, if you're saved, what are you saved from? We're saved from the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. The just wrath of God is poured out on all unrighteousness. And, and that's what all of us deserve. That's what we all deserve. Every yes. single person. Yes, people love to say things like, well, I'm saved from fear, I'm saved from myself, or I'm saved from guilt. Those are all things that maybe are byproducts of being a Christian, but all of those things pale in comparison to the wrath of God. We are saved from the wrath of God. Um, and so when you, but, but if you don't have that perspective and you're just going to church or you're going to the Bible trying to better your life here on the earth, then you may, you're going to be taking some of that, then you'll be taking some of Tony Robbins, then you'll be taking some of Zig Ziglar, then you'll be taking some of John Maxwell. You'll be, you'll be just kind of jumping around and be like, well, what's the most beneficial? You'll be taking some Indian proverbs. 
<laughs> and, and, and you're like, well, this is really helpful to my life, or this is not helpful to my life, or I know it's true because it made my life better. No, that's that's not at all what Christianity is founded on. It is the ultimate source of truth, and it's for eternal purposes too. Our eternal salvation is at stake here, not next year's bottom line, or not our the not even just the health of our marriage five years from now or ten years from now, or the you know our the health of our children and how well they do in life. Again, are those fruits of the Christian life? Yeah, a lot of times they are. Like a lot of times that those, uh, God loves a, a fruitful, that is a normal Christian marriage, <laughs> is a thriving marriage. Mm-hmm. Children that walk in the faith. Um, but, but sometimes like, your spouse dies when you're a Christian. Sometimes. Or sometimes your marriage can get a lot harder because yes. you are a certain faith and maybe your spouse isn't and they're opposed to that or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, so, yes. um, it, honestly, watching, like, if, if you were to go somewhere from here and you're, like, trying to figure out, because uh, obviously Elisha and I just, like, just threw a bunch of riddles at the wall, so. Yeah, this is, like, Enjoy based off of, yeah. Um, <laughs> but if you go to the American Gospels, like, read the American Gospel. What was that called? The American? The documentary? Yeah. Yeah, the American Gospel. I think they've got a really good articulation. I think they articulate the gospel, gospel really well. very well. Yeah, I'd say like the first half. Honestly, the free version on YouTube. Nails it? Nails it, I think, okay, yeah. Okay, we'll link that for you I think it's like 50 minutes or something, yeah. Okay, so that nails it. So we'll That's share that. Yeah. yeah, I know the first one, um, the first one was not my favorite. The second one, I really, really, really loved. Um, but anyways, I just think that those were... I learned so, so much as a believer for my entire life. I just felt like that really sparked a lot of clarity in my faith and defined a lot of terms I was fuzzy about. And um, it was really edifying and growing and revealing to me. And then, I don't know, where would you say if someone's like unsure about where they're at? Like they believe in God, but they aren't sure. Yeah. What, what do, yeah. Where do I go from here kind of thing? I you think know? people are intimidated by the Bible. And again, I'm not, just the Bible. It, it, yeah, but where would you start in the Bible? Bible? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to first go. You can go to. Okay, well, let, let me. Uh, maybe we can link this after I think about it for a second. But <laughs> oh, all the word. Honestly, all the word any God, of the, reading it straight it, through is incredible. Yeah, it's like you want to give people the five minute. This is your eternity, so there shouldn't be like a time limit you put on. Oh, that takes too long to read that. Like. No, read all the Gospels a lot of times. So yeah, read, start from Genesis 1. Honestly, like, I did that this year in the spring. Just starting from Genesis 1, read it all the way through to Revelation. And it is so cool. You see the consistency in God's character. You see the consistency in man's frailty and just mm-hmm. our humanity. Yes. You see the consistency of his wrath and uh, um, his love and also his wrath and judgment. And you just see it all so clearly laid out when you just read from Genesis to Revelation, and like you said, the Gospels are great, I think, for... Yeah, if you're getting started, uh, again, yeah. read the Gospels, and then, and then Romans. I think if you're somebody that maybe has been brought up in a Christian home, or again, using the whole the cultural Christian home, um, that title, you've called yourself a Christian, I think that Romans just, it, it it's like the step-by-step, this is actually how you're saved. This is the justification piece and sanctification Piece and it, and it does speak to the glorification in there as well, and it and it lays out really systematically what Jesus Christ accomplished. Because the Gospels, again, I love the Gospels, but they are a narrative. You know, they are it's it's, it's telling a story of what Jesus did, and it's got piece, bits and pieces here and there, and you're trying to figure things out. Like if you just read the Sermon on the Mount, you're like, well, oh, man, that's hard. Like blessed are the poor in spirit. And they're like, what's my idea to do God. all those things? What's the deal? with this and like Jesus's life and death, it serves a bigger, like it's a, a whole, it's a whole, a whole story and it's a whole, it's serving a whole purpose. And Romans really breaks that down well for you, I think. That's good. And when you were saying, when you're speaking on the Beatitudes there or the Matthew, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed mm-hmm. are the meek, blessed are they who mourn. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to share what you share real quick? I mean, again, I don't know what context people have been brought up in or that they've been going to church, but like 99% of the teachings on those things were just like moral teachings. I mean, even going back to the homeschool curriculum I was brought up with 
it's okay well blessed are the meek okay well what does it mean to be meek how do you become meek like are you meek enough like who is meek or blessed are they the mourn or the poor in spirit and uh as if as if we're told to become those things and that's not the context at all which he's telling these people you know he's just saying they are blessed these people are the poor in spirit through christ through his life um and then as that whole sermon on the mount continues it is not good news people's like oh gospel he's like good news like that that section is not good news at all it is overwhelmingly oppressive if you come away from that feeling good about yourself then you're misreading or you've got a very lofty view of yourself because if you read matthew 5 6 and 7 and you're honest with yourself you come away and be like dang like who who can be saved who can get into heaven mm-hmm. like i how does how does anybody do this and then he goes on to say oh well yeah with man it's impossible but with god all things are possible and so i think it's so good to have that perspective when you are going through the gospels of that jesus is doing that he's setting a higher standard he's not coming and saying hey i'm here and that law yeah that was kind of rigid and it was a bit oppressive i'm way more lenient now i'm all about grace i'm all about just finding you know your living a, the life to your fullest and maximizing your joy here on earth he says you know the law that actually is nothing i'm gonna ratchet it up like a hundredfold and that's now the new standard so go ahead follow me so i mean what how he says yeah it's impossible with god with man but with god all things are possible that's good. Yeah, I wasn't expecting you to stop right there. <laughs> but I think that that's super powerful. And then if you're going to get a uh, Bible, I just really encourage a word by word translation. So not a paraphrase, because really, I mean, basically with the paraphrase, you guys just listen to us read Matthew, Romans and John. <laughs> and by listening to this podcast, no, I'm true. just saying that's a paraphrase. Like people can say whatever they want; they're paraphrasing scripture. Yes. And I really think it's not helpful when it comes to actually hearing from God. You want God's holy word. So, yes. um, if you're curious on how the Bible was canonized, like why can we trust the scripture? Is it really divine revelation from God, or did a bunch of just humans that are fallible get together and write out what they thought people should do? Uh, Because that was a question that I had um, a few years ago. I was just like, how how do I trust this book? Because Mm -hmm. I'm taking it very literally in my life. Some of these books, some of these verses have really big ramifications. And how do I trust that it wasn't just, you know, 66 um, different authors or whatever? I don't think it was 66 different authors. There's 66 different books. I think books, yeah. Yeah, but less than that when it comes to authors. Um, Anyways, so, so... Felicia Masonheimer's podcast, Verity, does a fantastic job breaking down the canonization of scripture. I think she has like four or five episodes um, that walk you through point by point how all the Christian scripture was canonized. She also shows you the difference between um, the Catholic Bible and why there are some books in that, like the Apocrypha and other things that our Bible does not have and why. Um, So I just learned a ton through that. And then something else... Uh, like a good study Bible is also helpful if you feel like, um, okay, well, some of these words and meanings, like it's just kind of hard to understand what's going on here. I think there's a lot of false Christian teaching out there, especially when it comes to devotionals and word studies and all those things. Cause, cause you have to be really specific with those because a person's perspective is strong, strongly infused through those things, which could be great if you're really like, um, if that person has a real walk with God and they're sure. just... And their perspective brings new insight that is yeah. backed by scripture. Yeah, it, they articulate things in a way that really resonates with you. It can be a really healthy thing, but as a new believer, I would encourage just the more of the Bible, I mean, to all of us, but just the more of the Bible that we can read, just the straight Bible, like the better. And so um, my sister actually just got a study Bible that is really incredible. It's, it's John MacArthur's study Bible. Um, and I think that it's just a really solid reference point to start with. Nice. Well, good boy, Katie. Should we wrap it up? Yeah, probably. We probably <laughs> talk for a long time. Our kids are over their nap in there. Um, but yeah, ultimately, you guys, we just love you so much. We're so grateful for mm. you. 
Um, and we just we want you to hear truth from us and not just truth that's going to impact this life here, not just some good ideas, but truth that is the truth, the way, the truth, the life. Um, which is Jesus Christ. Absolutely. You know, it's so funny, just this is going to be the last thing, because you said, ultimately, and it reminded me, anytime I would have a theological conversation growing up with friends or siblings, you get to be, you like, wrap things up, then people, like, because you, like, want to almost, like, clear the air. Sometimes if there's a little disagreement or maybe there's some tension, there's some controversy in some of the things that you're saying, and people say, well, ultimately, and then it's fill in the blank. Ultimately, you know, you just need to love God. Or ultimately... Oh, it's all about true. Jesus. Oh, or ultimately, like you know, it's all about the heart. Those would be like all these big statements. I'm like, wow, okay, wow, those are huge. You're saying ultimately is kind of like a really big uh, pre- prefix or like a big setup, you know? Um, what did I say though? I said, well, you I, we love you. You said ultimately, we love you guys. That's ultimate. I agreed with your term. Like, that's why we're doing this. Um, but I just want to say that ult- like ultimately, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the light. Like, in, in life. Um, yeah, you're right. And no, nobody goes to the Father except through Him. And I think that's what we wanted to communicate. We're not telling people that don't believe that to get lost or to hightail it out of here. We, with this podcast, if it's helpful for you, it's helpful for you. But we don't want to, people to, to think that, like, oh, if you've got a different religion, like, yeah, ultimately they're all kind of the same, or ultimately it's about the heart, or ultimately... We all have our perspective of God, and he speaks to us in different ways, and so it's whatever you kind of want it to be. No, we're not saying ultimately any of those things. Ultimately, Jesus Christ is the, is the only way. Um, and, and, and we love freaking everybody. Freaking everybody we love. Okay, well, I should, you should not say that. Okay. No, we love everybody, uh, and that's why we just did this podcast. Yeah. All right. Farewell. Bye.